we have been in a sermon series uh, that has uh, progressed in talking about how to be missionaries in a changing culture. Uh, many missionaries go to another culture and they have to uh, adapt to a new language, uh, maybe immerse themselves in language learning. Uh, there are different customs uh, that they need to get acquainted with. And so they need to adapt uh, to where they are going in order to contextualize the sharing of the gospel. Uh, we here in America have the same gospel that missionaries take outwardly, but what we're finding is our culture is changing around us. How can we continue to share the good news of Jesus Christ to others as our culture seems to shift and change uh, rapidly around us. That's what we're learning through the book of Acts. So I'm going to go get my notes and come back. Just the word that you wanted to hear, pandemic. A pandemic is an epidemic of infectious disease that spreads throughout human populations uh, across a large region. It could fill an entire country, or as we found out, a pandemic is an epidemic that has gone worldwide. It's a term that we've become all too familiar with lately as the coronavirus has now become a pandemic. And what we've learned about this particular COVID-19 virus is that uh, it is not picky. While some folks are more susceptible to it than others, this virus does not discriminate. Every age, color, race, economic level, health history of a person can be affected, infected by COVID-19. And as it spreads, doing its physical and emotional and relational and economic damage, everyone becomes affected by it. Not everybody becomes infected, but we are all affected by it. So on the one hand, you may not get this virus. And the folks around, do, around you and the people that you know, they may not contact it uh, and contract it either. But on the other hand, you may get it. And or your friends and family may also be infected by it. Here's the tricky thing about a communicable disease. It's very easy to spread it around to others, especially when you're a carrier of the disease. A, a handshake here, a sneeze there, a hug here, a crowded plane there, and boom, it's spreading like wildfire. Epidemiologists, those are the people who study epidemics and pandemics. They work hard to find the origins of the disease, its physical makeup, how to uh, uh, defeat it, vaccinate against it, uh, basically how to beat it. And one of the con uh, crucial components of an epidemiologist study is identifying patient zero. Who started it? Who were they around? To whom did they pass it on to? Where did those people go? Whom did they expose? And before you know it, an unseen germ or virus has exploded into an epic worldwide event. The book of Acts is about a gospel pandemic. It's the historical record of how the good news of Jesus Christ started in the outskirts of a town called Bethlehem and how it moved into Jerusalem and then spread through Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the world. Listen now to Acts chapter 16 about some of the people who were swept up in a spiritual pandemic and caught the life-giving gospel. Acts 16. Paul also came to Derbe and to Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him and took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. 
And they went on their way through the cities. They delivered to them for observance the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith, and they increased in numbers daily. Skipping now down to verse 11. So setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace, and the following day to Neapolis, from there to Philippi which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city for some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after, she was baptized, and her household as well. She urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And so she prevailed upon us. As we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune-telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And she kept doing this for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus to come out of her. And it came out of her that very hour. And when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, These men are Jews and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us Romans to accept or practice. Well, the crowd joined in in attacking them, and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon Paul and Silas, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly, there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out in a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. After they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house, and he took them in uh, the same hour of the night and washed their wounds, and he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up to his house and set food before them. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. It would be hard to imagine a more diverse group than these four people who had a gospel encounter in Acts chapter 16. We have a young lad who was raised by his mother and grandmother. We have a wealthy businesswoman. We have an exploited slave girl, and we have a rough Roman jailer. All very different, but the gospel isn't biased towards one group of people over another. All four of these diverse individuals were changed by the same gospel, the same message of good news, and all four of them were welcomed into the same church of Jesus Christ. Think about and observe their national origins. 
Timothy's father was Greek and his mother was Jewish. Lydia was an immigrant from Thyatira living in Philippi, which was a very cosmopolitan city, having been Greek before it was Roman. And we have the slave girl, probably Greek. She could have been trafficked from anywhere. We don't exactly know. And most likely, the jailer was a retired uh, Roman soldier or an army veteran. So all of their national origins were very diverse and mixed. Socioeconomically, they have very different backgrounds. Timothy seems to be a bit uh, well-educated. Lydia was wealthy. She had a, a large enough home to take in four missionaries in addition to all of her household. The slave girl came from the opposite end of the social spectrum. One could not sink much lower in public estimation than to be a female slave. She owned nothing, not even herself. She had no possessions, no rights, no liberty. She had no life of her own. Even the money she made um, by fortune-telling went straight to her master's pockets. The jailer was probably socially halfway between the women. Uh, having, uh, uh, being in charge of the city prison uh, meant that he was a subordinate official in government service, so he was a, probably a respected member of the middle class. Interestingly, the head of a Jewish household would use and pray the same prayer every morning, giving thanks that God had not made him a Gentile, a woman, or a slave. But here are four representatives of these despised categories, redeemed and united by the good news of Jesus Christ. I think it's these people in Philippi that prompted Paul to write in his letter to the Galatians, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Not only did they have different national origins, not only were they socio and economically different, but they all had differing personal needs. We're told by Timothy that, uh, we're told that Timothy was raised by his mother and grandmother, which makes it sound like his father wasn't around. Don't know if he was a traveling merchant, maybe he had passed away. But it sounds like he needed a father figure. And perhaps that is why Paul invited young Timothy to join him in his missionary journey. Timothy became Paul's protege. Paul became Timothy's father figure, not just a spiritual father, but one who gave him counsel and helped him grow up. Lydia, obviously, was a seeker of spirituality. She was a, a Gentile attracted to Judaism, believing in Yahweh, but not fully satisfied with her spirituality until Paul told her about Jesus Christ. The slave girl had multiple needs. If socially she belonged as a slave to her masters, psychologically she belonged to a controlling spirit. She was, in a sense, in a double bondage. She had lost her identity. She had lost her individuality as a human being. But she became a fully integrated person when this controlling spirit left her and the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ came and inhabited her. And I believe Luke is telling us that she was delivered as well as converted. As for the jailer, I think he needed grace. All he knew was might makes right, and eye for an eye, even if it meant his own death. Inexplicably spared by Paul and Silas and the other prisoners, his eyes were opened to unmerited favor. 
to the grace and mercy that comes to those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. My friends, God never meant for the gospel to be sheltered in place. He sent his very own son to bring healing and hope to everyone, regardless of their family of origin, their education level, their social standing, or their economic strata. Think about Jesus himself. Jesus interacted with a wide diversity of people during his public ministry, both Jews and Gentiles. He hung out with unschooled fishermen, a Syrophoenician woman, two tax collectors of note, Matthew and Zacchaeus. And tax collectors were uh, bottom feeders uh, in the opinions of people. Or as you Ohio State fans, that's how you treat Michigan fans. That's how Jews treated tax collectors. You get the picture. But not only that, Jesus loved children. He said, come unto me, dogpile on me, kids. And he laughed and he looked at them and he called them to faith as well. Jesus hung out with those who were lame and those who were leprous, not just diseased people, but social outcasts. I was thinking about Jesus this week and how most of the movies that I saw uh, leading up to Easter depict Jesus, and boy, they get serious Jesus right He always seems to be in his head thinking very serious thoughts, maybe a bit glum, and uh, he's just overly uh, grave. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, if this person attracted so many people that didn't want to just hear his teaching, they couldn't have been attracted to Jesus just because he was the smartest guy in the room. After a while, we don't want to hang around with those people because they show us our ignorance. No, there had to be some amount of charisma and laughter and a gleam in his eye and a smile on his face that people said, I want to be with this guy. And I'm thinking, yeah, there's Jesus. He goes and heals a leper. He hugs him. He, he touches him. You're not supposed to touch a leopard. They have a very communicable disease. Jesus did not shelter into place. He did not cover himself with mask and gloves and shield. He touched a very diseased person and healed him. And then I'm sure Jesus walked away. And then during that day, I'm sure Jesus would look at John and say, high five, buddy. And John would go, oh, wait, he might have leprosy. And Jesus would go to to Philip and say, come on, man, bro hug. And he would recoil and goes like, "Uh uh-oh, I might have leprosy now. And Jesus would just go around slapping guys. You know how guys do, whacking each other in the head, giving them an elbow, and Jesus is is spreading this leprous disease, and they're all fearful of what might happen. I think Jesus was that kind of a fun guy. He must have been because the partiers wanted to hang out with Jesus, and prostitutes were not threatened by him. He hung out with Pharisees and the hoity-toity types as well, but also by a Samaritan woman at a well. And whether they be zealots or skeptics or centurions or criminals, Jesus interacted with a wide diversity of people, and he was not a discriminator in whom he wanted to affect. With all of them, Jesus shared his Father's heavenly love for them. He offered all of them healing, restoration, redemption of body, mind, soul, and spirit. Jesus was patient zero, spreading God's love with everyone that he came in contact. And those who caught the good news, those who believed in Jesus that he was the savior of the world, they spread that good news of God's gracious forgiveness and healing to those around them. And those folks spread it to their family and friends. And on and on and on, it was an epidemic. It was a gospel pandemic. And then it eventually caught up with this 
self-righteous, smarter than everybody, Pharisee named Saul. And it ravished him. This gospel got a hold of him and it turned his world upside down. And he wasn't ashamed about being affected, infected by the gospel because as he later said as Paul, it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. First to Jew, then the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is, it is revealed. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Friends, if you're, you are in need of hope and healing today, if you are scared of what this disease might do to your body or to your loved ones, if you want to be fully human and fully integrated, if you need someone to make sense out of this crazy world and the times we're living in, then I say to you what Paul said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. My friends, Jesus is offering this as a gift. And all you have to do is receive it. Now, if you already got Jesus and believe the good news, then other people around you are going to be exposed to your friend Jesus and this good news. And some of them might actually get infected by Jesus. It doesn't take much, believe me. Just open your home and share hospitality with some folks. Not yet. Not until the governor gives the order, but when you're ready, share your life with someone. Ask them what you can pray for, even six feet apart. Say, is there something I can pray for you? Most people don't turn that down. Lend them some assistance, but point them to Jesus Christ. My friends, you don't have to be an expert in the Bible to do that. You don't have to have all of the, the answers to life's ills. Because after all, more is caught than taught. Simply share the love of Jesus to others in your way and in your words and in your manner. And Christians, don't be a false positive if you get tested for Jesus. Be a full-blown positive. Don't be a fence-sitter with Jesus. He gave his all to you, so let's give our all to him. And as we do so, this good news, it's not good advice, it's not good counsel, it's not good ways to live life, it's good news, and we can believe and receive that good news. And as we do so, let's continue to do what Jesus encouraged us to do. He said, my friends, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives its light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. We are in a global pandemic with a disease, but my friends, the gospel pandemic has been going on for thousands and thousands of years. And I hope that you get infected by Jesus. And I hope that you become a carrier and that you will share the same hope and love and forgiveness that Jesus has given you to those around you. Let's pray. Lord, we, um, we are in unsure times right now, and we have ample uh, and many reasons to have some fears and some doubts. And Lord, I pray that you would come and you would alleviate them, that you would give us the peace that passes all understanding because we guard and keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. 
And while death and fear is around us, I pray that you would bring peace and life to us. The same peace and life that you gave to people like a demon-possessed slave girl, to a rich businesswoman who was put together, but yet she was a seeker of the truth and you met her, to a Philippian jailer who went from suicide in one moment to eternal life the next. And this all happened because of the good news of Jesus Christ. May we, as best we can and with as much as we have, accept this gift and believe you, the Lord and Savior of this world and our hearts. Amen.